Brian, why don't you come up and join us? Uh, it, you know, when, when I started getting more deeply involved in this topic of money and politics and campaign finance and all that, uh, people told me, yeah, that's boring. That puts people to sleep. Well, we got the creature from the Black Lagoon today. <laughs> and it's really, it takes a lot of attention in terms of the details. But seriously, it is complex. Um, and we know it's a marathon. Uh, but thanks a million, Rich. And pun intended. <laughs> um, I ask. Uh, Jeff and Ian to join in their idea of the procedure that they're each going to get five minutes of commentary uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions to the floor and all three can respond. So uh, Ian and Jeff, do either one of you have a preference of going first? Jeff, you're up. Uh, I, I really don't have to introduce Jeff. Jeff Irwin is a state senator from this district, those of you who live in Ann Arbor are fortunate to be represented by one of the best, if not the best, uh, legislature in Lansing. How he goes up there and comes back sane every day is a tribute to his strength. Uh, Jeff, thanks for being here. Thanks, Stu, and thanks everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to serve this community, so it's not a frustrating endeavor. It's actually uh, an amazing opportunity I have to go up to Lansing and fight on behalf of you know, public education funding and environmental protection and uh, equal going? rights and campaign finance reform. So we're going to be talking a little more in the afternoon about some of the specific uh, you know, bills and policies that some of us state legislators are advocating. But I just wanted to ping off of a little bit of what we got this morning from Rich Robinson. Uh, I always appreciate hearing him talk because it's always an exciting talk. I always learn something. And I also uh, have a tremendous amount of heart for fellow Ubers. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, youpers were everywhere. Yes. Uh, so there's uh, there's been a lot happening in this in this area. Uh, Rich hit on a lot of the key points. Um, you know, I think what we're seeing now in Michigan, what we've been seeing over the last few successive elections, is really shifting power in the landscape of politics and political giving as a result of Citizens United, Senate Bill Six Six One, uh, McCutcheon now. Um, so. You know, we've seen this huge increase in power and in giving to the interest groups. So power really shifted from the candidates to these interest groups. And now we're seeing maybe, maybe the parties get back into it. And one of the messages I always want to give to fellow citizens about these issues, about issues of uh, campaign finance reform, about issues of mandatory and experience laws like term limits, things like part-time legislature, I always want to communicate to folks who are interested that us politicians like us or hate us, we're the only ones in the game who are directly accountable to the people we work for. We're your agents in the legislature. And when you diminish our power, you're diminishing the power of the people. And you're increasing the power of the interest groups and the moneyed interests who are trying to get a certain result out of Lansing. So that's one of the things I think that I would offer to you is that we have an opportunity to um, work on an issue here with campaign finance reform that really uh, straddles both parties. We have an opportunity to work with liberals and conservatives to say we need cleaner elections, we need to get the big money out of politics, we need transparency and accountability, we need to fight corruption. Uh, all of those are, are, are important goals. And, and in doing that, I think we need to recognize that the politicians, we're the ones who are directly accountable to you. So that's one thing I would offer. And I would also offer that uh, we have a huge changing landscape in terms of how people get their information. I think this is an opportunity for all of us to, to gain power in this relationship. Uh, Ten years ago, I saw a statistic that I thought was really jarring, which was that 75% uh, of Americans get 100% of their information from the television. Right? That's a 10-year-old statistic, and it's changing pretty rapidly. This is one of the reasons why these campaigns are able to get by just running an air war, trying to win just through TV ads. And you're going to see that with Terry Lynn Land this year, because she is utterly incompetent. This woman cannot stand in front of a group and give a speech for what she cares about and what the value of the state of Michigan. I can say that because I'm a part of it. Um, uh, and she's running against Gary Peters, who, you know, like or dislike Gary Peters, I like him. Uh, he is a, is a smart guy who can hold his own. Terry Lynn Land can't do that. So you're going to see her trying to run a complete air war campaign and win it with TV ads. But what's changing in the public, and something that we can all be a part of changing, is how people get their information. People trust information coming from a friend. People trust information coming from a coworker or a community member. 
So, so I, I, I want to encourage you to access the power you have in your communities, access the power you have in your circles to communicate some of these ideas and to make sure that, that we're reaching out to our networks because we have tremendous power in the networks that we've created and the networks of people who trust us. Um, Stu's going to give me the hook here in just a second. So um, one other thing I wanted to add, just as a point of perspective from the legislature, uh, is that um, you know we think about corruption, and we think about the big issues we focus on. And I want you to try to separate those two. Most of the issues that I get elected on, like education funding or pro-choice versus pro-life, those are the kind of issues that it's very, very difficult for a legislator to change their position on. Right? I ran as a pro-choice uh, politician. It would be very, very difficult for someone to come along with a check big enough to make me pro-life. That's just not going to happen. But what I think you need to understand as citizens is that um, there are all sorts of issues that we deal with in the legislature that you never hear about. And these are the issues that are on line 14 of page 65 of that bill about pipeline safety. Or line 10 of page 16 of that bill about uh, charter schools. You know, that's where the lobbyists, that's where the interest groups uh, make their money. And that's where politicians do get corrupted along the way. Because someone comes along and they say, gosh, my pipeline company, we would do much better if this little regulation about how often we have to test that equipment were changed for maybe five years to ten years. How about it? And the politicians know, the politicians know that the citizens, for the most part, are reading line 14 of page 63 of that pipeline bill. Right? That's not what's on the newspaper every day. And unfortunately, that's not what we're sending out on Facebook and Twitter every day. So we need to get a little more savvy. I think we need to be a little more active reaching out to our networks, communicating some of this deep information that we don't see on TV and we don't see in the newspaper, and making sure people know about the flood of dark money that is coming into our state and to, to affect our politics, and to let people know that there's an easy solution, a solution that should be embraced by, by, by bipartisan folks, um, a solution of disclosure. And we can get those into our laws, and, um, and that's why I think we should be organizing around. Thanks. Thank you. Ian Vanderwalker is Ian Vaughn should come on up. Uh, <laughs> so Ian Rich, if I could sit here while Ian's talking. Uh, Ian's from New York. He's a counsel at the Brennan Center, um, New York University, an attorney. <laughs> Uh, it spends his time working in this field, uh, one of the top professionals uh, in the country. Uh, I can say, as I started to educate myself on these issues, one of the resources that I turned to, and I think it's one of the best resources out there for you to educate yourself, uh, get online and look at all the information the Brennan Center offers. There are a couple good articles on the road table uh, next door also. Um, Ian will also be presenting a workshop this afternoon uh, on small donor systems and has a lot of experience from the city of New York and the state of New York on that issue. But I ask him to make some comments on this session too. So Ian, welcome to Michigan. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks to uh, Rich for such a great presentation. Um, so I just wanted to add a little bit about McCutcheon, the case that the Supreme Court decided this week. Um, you know, the, the good news is after McCutcheon, we all have the right to spend more than $123,000 in this year's cycle like, uh, on, on federal elections. It's raining so I'm sure <laughs> next year it's going to be, the bank account's going to take a hit. Um, so, so, but, but McCutcheon leaves in place everything else other than those aggregate limits. The base limits are still there. You can only give each person $5,200. Um, McCutcheon says nothing about, uh, well actually McCutcheon is, is in favor of disclosure. Says one of the reasons we don't need this aggregate limit is because we have a good disclosure system, which is questionable. Um, but but the, the sort of disturbing thing, I think, about the case, and this is, in, in this sense, is similar to Citizens United. Citizens United had a, had a narrow holding, but there was language in there that was sort of expansive about, you know, money in politics isn't corruption, money in politics is, is actually free speech that led to uh, super PACs and led to other things that are, have harmed our democracy. And McCutcheon is the same way. There's language in McCutcheon, uh, as Jocelyn mentioned earlier, um, talking about what well, corruption is this very narrow thing, it's really just bribes, um, when we all know that that's not right. But there's also language in McCutcheon that says, people have a First Amendment right 
to spend money through campaign contributions and, and in doing so, get access to legislators. Get a legislator to pick up the phone when you call knowing that you wrote that uh, $3 million check at their joint fundraising committee last year. The, John Roberts and the other conservatives on the court actually believe that this is what the First Amendment is for. That the Constitution's free speech protections are about letting people use their money to get what they want out of government. They think that's a positive thing. Um, and that's so out of touch, it's so offensive, it's so disturbing to think that the high, the, there's a majority of, of people in the highest court in the land that think that that's a good thing about democracy. <coughs> They're completely wrong about that, and, and, and unfortunately that trend is going to continue until there's a membership change on the Supreme Court. Um, so in all of our reform uh, efforts, I think that's something you need to keep in mind. You need to keep in mind that the next time there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, there has to be a lightning focus on campaign finance issues and on changing the crazy ideas about the Constitution that this court is propagating. Um, and, and, and just, I just want to quickly wrap up by saying, emphasizing that McCutcheon is bad, um, Citizens United was bad, but they leave avenues open for reform. One of them is disclosure, as both Jeff and Rich talked about. Um, you know, Citizens United says disclosure is a good thing, McCutcheon says disclosure is a good thing. In the federal system, there's relatively good disclosure, but we need disclosure of all the dark money by nonprofits. It just doesn't exist. Congress could do it, um, and they should do it. In the states, we need improved disclosure. It's a patchwork across states. Some, some states are better than others. We need disclosure across the board. And the other thing is public campaign financing. I'm going to talk, uh, as Stu mentioned this afternoon, in detail about public campaign financing, how it's worked for New York City. Um, and other uh, places in the country and how that can improve the system, not by limiting some the richest people's money because the Supreme Court says we can't do that, but by bringing everybody else up through matching their donations. Um, and that has been blessed by the Supreme Court multiple times. It's still constitutional as of today. And um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna stop there. And if you don't mind, my question is to me, what's coming next? And the answer is this, uh, in Iowa it is legal for a union to make a contribution directly to a candidate. It is not legal for a profit making corporation to give a contribution to a candidate. Jim Bopp, who is the attorney behind all of this effort to unravel campaign finance regulation in, in this country, is about to apply for certiorari for the U.S. Supreme Court to take up the question of why can't corporations give directly to candidates? That will be, that's the next big Supreme Court case coming, and that will be an effort to say corporations can give just like people. I also saw a story in the news today that Mitch McConnell has a bunch of overage contributions. People gave too much money to his campaign committee, and I don't think it's accidental, and I think Mitch McConnell is going to have another run at the Federal Election Commission, and the point of that will be to remove limits on contributions everywhere. Just more freedom, more speech. <laughs> Uh, I hope to, uh, you know, I hope I'm wrong, hate to bring you down, but I think that's what's coming. You know, when the court did Wisconsin Right to Life, which was really is just as important in my mind as Citizens United was, because that was the first break in the dam to let the corporate money into the process, and even though it was for issue ads, you know what issue ads are. It's a step-by-step -step process, that's what I was getting at. And when Chief Justice Roberts wrote that opinion, Scalia wanted him to go much further than he did. And there was a footnote chiding Roberts for his faux judicial restraint in dealing with the process. They wanted to go the distance at the time. And it, you know, it, the, the makeup of this court, you know, this was a plurality decision. And, uh, Clarence Thomas assented to the outcome, but he had his own take on the th situation. Well, it, notably, we've talked about Citizens United and disclosure. It was an eight to one vote. The one vote against was Clarence Thomas, and he brought forth the idea of, oh no, this is going to open up intimidation. 
and you hear all the parents on the right fighting against intimidation or against disclosure now, invoking the argument of intimidation. You know, I guess they think the next time David Koch is wandering the aisles of Walmart, somebody's going to puke on his shoes or something. <laughs> but it's a step-by-step -step process in deregulating campaign finance, and that's what they're doing. And, and by the way, about Clarence Thomas, you know, there's a, a beautiful uh, vignette in Jeffrey Tubin's book, The Nine, about the Supreme Court, where... Uh, he recounts somebody ask, asking Justice Scalia to compare his judicial philosophy to Clarence Thomas. And Scalia's response is, I'm an originalist, not crazy. <laughs> I wouldn't use that, but Clarence Thomas is without question a radical. He's way out there. I'm wondering if one of you would care to comment about the necessity of amending the Constitution as a first step to allow all of those other kinds of legislation and reform to occur? Uh, the United States Constitution yes, is, uh, we all remember the Equal Amendments, right? Equal Rights Amendment. Equal Rights Amendment. <coughs> Steve Klein, that's what I have to say. So the 16-year-old vote went right through, but people were all ginned up. Yeah, I mean, a constitutional amendment is very hard. It also, it won't solve the problem by itself. A constitutional amendment might make certain laws constitutional, but you still need to pass those laws. So, you know, do this first and then that may not be the right way to think about it. Do everything at once may be the better way to think about it. Uh, and, and as I tried to mention, although this is even harder than a constitutional amendment, changing the composition of the court is one of those things. When a vacancy comes up, we have to make sure that that person has same ideas about the Constitution and uh, money politics. Yeah, I'm just going to agree with Ian and say, I mean, I think it's an all of the above strategy. We just heard some folks talking, I think it was Wes, maybe, and asked about, you know, couldn't there be some local initiatives to get some things on the ballot local, locally to pass? Now, that's not going to actually change anything. But what it does is it gets the ball rolling, and it gets the legislature on notice that that ball is rolling. And it starts to build some energy among the grassroots. And sometimes, I, at least my experience has been, these issues have to be worked from the top and the bottom at once in order to have maximum effect. And uh, that's why, you know, I've been supportive of ideas to amend the Constitution, but I've also been supportive of ideas at the state level to do smaller but equally important things like require disclosure, you know, things that maybe are more within our grasp. Thank you for our panel. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Jeff.